Well, good morning, everybody. Let's stand. We're going to sing our hearts out to the Lord. Worship Him. Give Him glory. Give Him honor. He's worthy, amen. worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Check it out. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way Cause he hung up on that cross Then he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away Now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. You guys ready? We were the beggars, sing it out. Now we're royalty, so true, we, we were, were the sinners. sinners. Now we run and free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it out. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Okay, so I have a question. Um, well, could you, could you guys do me a favor? Could you turn to the person next to you and just say, hey, if there's joy in the house of the Lord, could you please tell your face? Real quick. <laughs> oh, wait a sec. Thank you. I, I needed the help. I appreciate that. <sighs> Heavenly Father, as we gather here in your name, we exalt the name of Jesus, your son, who paid our price, who redeemed us with his blood. 
on a merciless cross. It's him that we worship this morning through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, move in this place. And we do all of this to the glory of God the Father. thing to say, no matter how much it costs, I give it to you. If you mean it, say it. Jesus, Jesus, my offering, all my ambition, my hopes and dreams, here's my life.
presence, Lord, in the beauty of your presence. Be glorified here, Lord, in the beauty of your presence, in the beauty of your presence. Church, you're going to take a moment right now. Those things that, that you need to give over to God, no matter how much it costs, I freely give it all to you. Well, if you sung those words and you meant those words, do it now. Talk right to Jesus. things that we should have done that we did not have the courage to do forgive us those times Lord Jesus we confess to you that there are times that we've done things we should have never done lingered where we should have never lingered focused where we should have never focused I can speak for me that sometimes I practice the ultimate in selfishness. Forgive me for that, Lord. We confess to you, Lord Jesus, right now.
to you, God, when we are standing in your presence, when we're truly standing in your presence, and you are here, God, our hearts cannot help. We cannot help but worship you. When we see you more clearly in who you are in all of your holiness, that you are so much greater, so much stronger, so much, so much more full of love and compassion than any place or person or thing on this earth, there is no one like you. 
And God, we, we want to turn from all the things that this world tries to offer in comparison. And it all pales in comparison to you, God, the holy, holy, holy one. And so, Lord, right now, we are compelled in our hearts to give you the highest praise, the highest worship. There is no one like you. And so right now, Father, we humble our hearts before you. We ask that you would do a mighty work in this place. Whether online or here in this room, Lord, come in your power and your strength. We surrender to your leading right now, Father. Lord, we may have plans this morning, but, but Father, you are ruling and reigning over all. And so we are your servants. We humble ourselves before you and pray that, Jesus, you would be glorified in this place. Change our hearts. Make us more like you, Jesus. Your word says that as you are holy, we are to be holy. And so we set ourselves apart now in this time and space to honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is awesome. Amen. All right, well, before you are seated, um, we want to take a time where we, we gather together and we, we fellowship and we have some coffee in the back, some Twin Valley coffee and some water. You're welcome to help yourselves. But I encourage you, uh, even, even introverts, I know it's hard sometimes, but uh, maybe find someone you've never met before, say hello, introduce yourself to them, get to know each other a little bit. This is part of what it means to be the church, is to, to fellowship with one another. And we have an icebreaker question for you, is would you rather, or would you rather question, would you rather only be able to whisper or only be able to shout if you had to choose? All right, have fun with that one. Let's not experiment right now, though. transplants from New England and we're involved in missions in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We love our church and for those of you who watch online or uh, attend here, it's just a great place, a great loving uh, community. We, we believe it's Christ-centered, uh, gospel-driven and spirit-led and that's what we look for in a church. Hope you get a chance to uh, attend not only the Sunday services but there's plenty of things going on during the week and a uh, great place to be. We're so thankful. God bless you. Jeff Reif and um, I've been coming to Hopewell here for about a year now and just want to welcome you all here to Hopewell this morning and we thank you for joining us this morning. I've been attending Hopewell Church since 1979. And one of my um, joys here is being a member of the JOY, the Just Older Youth Senior uh, Group, which we meet on the third Sundays of the month, starting in September. We usually have a program. We welcome all of you that are over 55 and thank you uh, online viewers for being with us this morning. God bless you.
our seats. That would be great. We can work our way back to our seats. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. We're going to get started here again. My name is Gary Buck. I'm the lead pastor here. I have the honor and privilege of being so. And, and a special welcome to those of you watching online, wherever you may be. And however you're joining us, thank you for doing so. We're really excited about what God's going to do in this place today, as we are every week. And uh, we're just, it's awesome to serve a God who surprises us even times, even again. Like I said before, when we have plans, we're just thankful that God sometimes surprises us. So welcome all of you. If, you, if this is your first time here uh, hopefully you received a bulletin when you walked in. If you did, would you please do us a favor by just filling out the little one portion or the tear-off portion? Fill it out for us. And, uh, and if you could turn that into somebody at the Welcome Center on your way out, which is out those doors to the right, right, to the right of the doors as you're exiting, we'd appreciate that. And on the other side, there's a spot for all of you. If you have prayer requests, we do have a team here that's committed to praying for all of you and your requests. And, uh, and so take advantage of that. We believe very much in the power of prayer. I've seen the power of prayer in my own life, and, uh, and I'm sure many of you have, have testimonies as well. So please take advantage of that also. I want to update you on something very quickly. Um, some of you were aware, but this past week we had our annual uh, teaching team or preaching retreat. That included the pastors, and this year we invited Tyler Hurst to come along as well. And uh, we did that on Tuesday through Thursday this past week. And uh, it was an awesome, awesome time. We do it every year, and God is always faithful. One of the things that we do in the first day is we kind of just say, all right, uh, just go away for a little while by yourself and just spend time with the Lord. Ask him what he wants to do or say uh, to Hopewell. And so then we come back together after a while, and we start sharing our notes and the things that we felt like God revealed to us. And it was awesome how God revealed some of the same exact verses. Um, and so we've, we've got a really awesome plan in store for us all in 2023 that we really are hoping and trusting that God has, has led us to. And so I'll be sharing some of that, those plans with you all in the coming weeks um, as we put that together for you all. But we're really excited about what God has in store for this church. So keep praying for us as we, as we try to listen to what God wants to say to all of us. Um, all right. And if you came ready to give this morning, thank you so much for your giving and your tithes and your offerings. Um, if, you, if you brought a physical gift, um, you can drop it off one of the boxes in the back, or you can give online or our church website or through our church app. And if you're newer here and you've never used our app, just go to your app store on your phone and search Hopewell Elverson. It's a great resource where you can go in there and you can, you can give through there, but, but you can also uh, watch or listen to like a podcast form, previous messages, um, and so I really encourage you to take advantage of that. It's, it's especially when we're in a series, we always encourage you, if you miss one, uh, make every effort to try to listen to the one before because a lot of these sermons build on each other. And, and today we're actually kicking off a new series as well. So uh, I encourage you to check that out. And if you are in fifth or sixth grade, your time has come. This is the most exciting part of the day, I know. Uh, fifth and sixth graders, we have a class for you called Breakaway Fifth and Sixth. So uh, you guys can head back to the back of the sanctuary, and we have a teacher that's going to take you down to your classroom. So fifth and sixth graders, enjoy that. All right, the rest of us can turn our attention to the screen for some announcements. Good morning, church. We have a lot of events happening this fall. Coffee and Crayons is hosting this watercolor workshop. Moms of young children are invited to this craft evening with a professional instructor. Come out for an evening of fellowship and learn step-by-step -step how to paint with watercolor. An $8 donation helps offset the cost of supplies. Register online today. Space is limited. Hopewell partners with multiple local organizations that provide aid to those in need. Starting the first Sunday of November, there will be bags with a list of vendors and supplies they are looking for. Designate which organization you wish to support, fill the bag, and return it to the church for our Thanksgiving service on November 20th. This is a great way to bless others in need this season. To learn more about what's happening at Hopewell, check out the bulletin or visit hopewellchurch.org. And remember, live well, love well, hope well. Excuse me a moment. I'm uh, uploading a photo of my latest project to our new church social media app. It's called Truth Book. I cannot wait for my friends to see my masterpiece. There. 
Check out this cool fall decoration I just made. It was totally simple to make. I finished it in half an hour, and I love how it brightens up my foyer. So happy. <sighs> it's not bad. Hmm. I wonder what this button does. Beneath the surface filter. Does uh, that make it look like it's underwater? Let's try it. Beneath the surface, level one. Actually, it was a lot harder to make than I thought. It took me four hours, and I was really frustrated by the time I was finished. And then when I set it up, I discovered I'd forgotten to glue half the berries, so I had to take it down and fix it? What? That is not true. Well, OK, it took longer than I thought it would, but it wasn't four hours. And it was the glue gun's fault that, that those berries didn't stick. <sighs> How do I turn this stupid filter off? Press it again, I guess. Beneath the surface, level two. I wish I could make my house look beautiful like all my crafty friends. Please give me a little validation here. Please prove you love me by liking this photo, even though my centerpiece is lopsided and the pumpkin looks like a doggy chew toy. I cannot believe this. I am proud of that wreath, and I am not, probably, fishing for validation. I don't care how many people like this photo. I don't, I don't spend all my time comparing myself to others. What kind of filter is this? The twist all your words into lies filter? How do I turn this thing off? <sighs> Maybe I should just delete it and post something political. That'll get everybody's attention. All right, this time I want to invite uh, Lester Zimmerman forward. Uh, first of all, um, this, this has been Pastor Appreciation Month. First of all, thank you for many of you who have, have given uh, some cards and just expressed verbally uh, uh, notes of appreciation. And uh, I, also wanna, I just thought it would be good to take a moment to also just express appreciation to Lester Zimmerman, who was my pastor for many years at Petra Church. And so this week, uh, we actually asked him, it was only about a week ago, because we had some snags with our schedules, um, and we asked Lester if he'd be willing to kick off our sermon series called Beneath the Surface. And so before we begin, Lester, first of all, thank you for filling in, and thank you for being here. And uh, I just want to pray a blessing over him and all of us as we are ready to receive his word. So, Father, we thank you so much for Lester. We thank you so much for your word. And right now, as we humble our hearts before you, we bless you, and we praise you, and we give you thanks. And we pray that as we come before you now, that you would speak to us very clearly, that our hearts would be opened, that our hearts would be soft like clay, to be molded and shaped by you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. One thing I forgot to mention is that uh, Lester is also the leader of the Hopal Network of Churches. So uh, thank you, Lester, for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pastor Gary. It is great to be back with you again. I love this time of year. All the leaves seem extra bright this year for some reason. Uh, my wife and I went on a train ride yesterday uh, to, it's one of those uh, scenic train rides we take down in Shrewsbury, we, would, we got on this train, and the thing derailed halfway through the, the ride, and we had a walk to find, get, out of the, get out to where our cars were and things, so I'll try to keep things on the rails here today as we, as we go th through this. Well, I'm, I'm really blessed to um, be here, and thank you, Pastor Gary and Pastor Wayne, for allowing me to kick off a new series for, for the church here. It's a privilege to be able to do that. So this morning is the first part, I believe it's a five-part series that you'll be doing. And the title of the series is Beneath the Surface, as the skit so, so uh, clearly portrayed that many times we are above the surface and we're very surfacey people at times. And the Lord wants to take us beneath the surface, and he wants us to be more authentic in how we relate to him and to others. Uh, the, the series that uh, we're doing here is, is um, from, taken from the book, uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. And it really looks like a great series. I got a chance to read through the book, 
And I think it's going to provide great conversation, great discussion in your small groups as you become real with each other, as you talk about how to apply uh, these things that you're going to be learning throughout this series. Uh, the title, Beneath the Surface, uh, portrays the truth that uh, there's so much more of us than what we really see. Uh, you know, we, we come here, we smile, we talk to each other, but there's so much more to all of us that is really beneath the surface than what we see publicly. Or that I think there's so much more than what we're personally, emotionally connected to in our lives. There's so much that we just kind of ignore or we've never gone there to really visit that part of, of our, our emotional being. And so there's, there's this part that remains hidden. The graphic that is being used is the iceberg, which is a great graphic for this series because it really gives us a, a visual to the spiritual truth. And for some ways, we're like icebergs, not that we're cold, but that there's, there's in an iceberg, they say there's like 10% that's usually visible. The other 90% is below the surface. It's all part of the same iceberg, but we see the, and we relate to the 10% many times. The 10% is what we think people want to see and want to hear about our lives. Uh, and, or sometimes the 10% is what we want to portray, that we want people to see. And we don't want them to see the other part. Um, so often we're showing the parts that we either aren't aware of ourselves or that we're embarrassed to reveal. It's the, it's the 90% that gets us in trouble. It's the 90% is what sinks Titanics. <laughs> the, the 90% is what sinks us many times spiritually in our lives because every now and then we run into something that we weren't prepared for because we weren't really dealing with that issue honestly in our lives. So the whole premise of the book, and this is one of the taglines with the book, is it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. So that's kind of the theme that runs throughout the book, that if we want to be emotionally mature or spiritually mature, we have to address the emotional part of us because the two really connect together. Uh, one affects the other in that way. So the truth is that emotionally, and to be emotionally and spiritually healthy, we need to allow Jesus to be a part of our whole being, not just the part we compartmentalize and call that's our spiritual self, but we need to allow Jesus to touch the other part of the iceberg, the other 90% of our lives. And that's what we're going to be visiting and looking at in the series. How does that work? How do we, how do we deal with that? so that we can really be authentic in who we are. The truth is, and this is our, the first point, the more emotionally aware we are, the more authentic we will be in our relationship with God and with people. That's so, so powerful. The more emotionally we are aware of that 90%, the more we're connected to that, the more we're honest with that, the more honest, the more authentic we're going to be in how we relate to God. See, it affects us spiritually. But also, how we relate to each other. The relational part of us is really tied into all of this. You know, even the business world understands this. Sometimes the church world, we're sometimes catching up to the business world. But the business world understands this. They, under, they realize the importance of having emotionally healthy people not just people with a great IQ or great skill set. Those are important, and those are usually part of the interview. But more and more in the business world, they're paying attention and, wonder, and going after the emotional, what they call the emotional intelligence or the EQ. The emotional uh, healthy people is what they're looking for. Because they know if, if they're not emotionally healthy, it's going to affect how they relate to the rest of the team. It's going to affect how they do their work. It's going to affect everything else. So you can have a great IQ. You can have a great skill set. I mean, you, you have all your degrees and you have everything you need. But if emotionally, you, that 90% 
You're not dealing with that. You're not in touch with that. It's going to catch up with you. It's going to be something that is going to affect the rest of you. So this is what they discovered. That an individual's ability to identify, evaluate, control, and express their emotions is just as important, if not more important, than their IQ and skill set. See, I believe this is also true, not, not just in the, in the business world, but, but also in our spiritual lives as well, that our emotional maturity has a direct impact on my spiritual life and relationships. Now, if you're like me, you may have grown up hearing the, the, the idea, the thought that emotions are not dependable. You know, don't live by your emotions. Forget your emotions. Uh, and so we have all these thoughts that, all these things that we've heard growing up about our feelings and our emotions that we really have put them down into the 90% area of our life. And to be really spiritual, you don't go there. You don't talk about emotions and feelings. To be really spiritual, you talk about the knowledge of God. You talk about all the spiritual things that you've learned like the skit that was put on. We, 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 social media, we talk about all the good things and how we've learned to pray for an hour every day. And, you know, we, we, we talk about that, but not the emotional part. So we've heard things like this. Big boys don't cry. Girls should not express anger. That's just unbecoming. Don't trust your feelings. You need to be rational, not emotional. You shouldn't feel that way. We should deny our feelings. After all, we're to die to ourselves. Sadness, anger, and fear are sin and unbelief. Be careful of emotionalism in worship. It's okay if you're rooting for the Eagles who are 6-0 and oh, and uh, the Phillies who are in the World Series. and You know, a rigid interpretation of these thoughts really creates spiritual bondage and uh, not freedom in our lives. You, you just come in bondage. Well, I can't show my emotion. I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to be more spiritual than this. Why am I struggling with anger? Why am I struggling with this? There must... And, and, and so we just shove it down. We suppress those things. And it's not helpful to do that. Uh, in the book, they list some signs that would indicate that we really don't know the emotional side of ourselves. And he, sa it, he says there's such things as we don't understand why we feel difficult emotions. What? We're just not in touch. I don't know why I'm feeling this way. I don't know why I'm feeling discouraged. I don't know why I feel sad. I don't know why I feel anger. I don't know why I feel fear. And, and you can just go on and on. That we're just, we just don't know because we've never gone there to unpack it. Or we don't recognize how our, our environments, our upbringing have impacted us. That is so true. I know my upbringing has really impacted me. Sometimes we feel our spiritual walk is fabricated, and we're just going through the motions. I mean, we've, we've learned how to do church. We've learned how to be a Christian, but because emotionally we're not connected to that part of us, it, it just feels like we're going through the motions, or we're more focused on doing for God instead of being with God, or we tend to over-spiritualize everything that happens to us. You know, it's either devil, the devil or this or that, because emotionally we don't connect with that. That really hurt me. That really upset me. You know, we, we, we don't go there. We just spiritualize it all. That way we can stay above the waterline with our emotions. We divide our life into secular and spiritual compartments. It's another indicator. Or we find it hard to be transparent with our weaknesses, our failures, our insecurities, and so on. Or another one he lists is we run from conflict. I mean, conflict just stirs emotions and all. And, and if we're not comfortable there in that emotional part of us, uh, conflict is really, really hard. It's, the, it's a thing to avoid at all costs. 
Because when those feelings start coming up, you don't know what to do with them. Maybe you feel out of control. There's so much that we're not aware of that lies beneath the surface in our lives. I have personally never been very comfortable, real comfortable with my feelings, with my emotions. I grew up in a conservative community, uh, a, the Pennsylvania Dutch. I grew up in, a, that was our, my family line. I, I grew up in a Mennonite church. And we really were taught to suppress our emotions, to suppress our feelings. My German background was more stoic. Uh, growing up, obedience was emphasized, and there was little to no value put on our feelings. In fact, I grew up with the thought that feelings were a sign of weakness. If you, if you needed to express your feelings, that's a sign of weakness, not spirituality. Christianity became more of a cultural and uh, traditional and uh, intellectual way of relating to God because that 90% of my life was still underwater. And so I related to God as, okay, he's God, I'm his servant, I just need to obey, obey. Whether I feel like it, it doesn't matter, my feelings don't matter, I just obey, do what God says, and it, so it was all very intellectual, very much up here. So we learn to suppress our feelings and our emotions. Anger, keep it down. Sadness, keep it down. Even wonder, you don't express it. Fear, joy, even joy and love. We don't get too excited. I mean, emotionalism, and you don't want to bring that into the church. That's how I grew up. Okay, so we keep it down, all that emotion. Uh, disgust, shame, it's all there, but you just keep it down. The things I listed are what, in the book, they listed, those are the basic categories of human emotion, and we all, we all feel those to one level or, or one way or another. I remember... The time uh, my wife and I went for marriage counseling, we had reached one of those roadblocks in communications that many couples reach in their lives. And, you know, when, when that happens in your life, you have a decision to make. You're going to, that roadblock can either send you on a path where you're just going to put up with a kind of a, a mundane marriage relationship, that's just who we are, we're just going to have to put up with each other, this is the way it is, and we're just going to make the best of it. Or you can say, no, I want a good marriage, and we're going to find a way through this. And so that, that was our, our attitude, that was our desire. So we said, we're going to go for counseling. I was a pastor at the time, and so that's kind of a humbling thing, okay, I'm a pastor, we, we need to go for marriage counseling. And uh, so we did. And uh, as the counselor listened to us, uh, he made a statement to me that he said, Lester, I sense that you have a lot of anger inside of you. It just totally shocked me. I mean, anger? I don't beat my wife. I don't yell at my wife. In fact, in our counseling conversation, I was very calm. There's no anger. What do you mean anger? I was getting angry. He was calling me angry. You know, it was just like. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? He was right. See, I felt anger was unspiritual. Anger was wrong. And so I just, every time something happened between my wife and I, I would just push the anger down. But it created a barrier in our communication, in our relationship. But I, I couldn't go there. I didn't know what to do with it. Because I grew up with the idea that you suppress that. That's part of your old nature. You just need to not be angry. And so I thought I wasn't, but I was. Uh, so the anger and you know, these many other emotions were this big iceberg beneath the surface in my life. Yeah, and it, takes, it took me time. If you haven't dealt with that part of you, uh, opening that up is both scary because you don't know what's all there, and you don't know, if I start really 
saying my anger or be putting words to my feelings, you know, where, where's it going to go? And so it can be kind of scary. And it takes time to unpack it is what I discovered. It's not just, well, we're going to make a commitment this morning. We're all going to be in touch with our feelings. No, it's, it's, it's a journey. It's a journey of saying, I want to go there. I'm willing to go there. And what the counselor did was gave me permission to go under the surface where the, the, the way I grew up, my, my family dynamics, well, we, I didn't have permission to go there. But now he was giving me permission to start looking at what was going on inside of me. And um, when I could start being honest with some of those things, uh, that began to change things. I began to be more authentic in my relationship with God. It affects God on my relationship with God. I didn't realize that. And I became more authentic in my relationship with my wife <clears throat> and how we related together. I realized I could not become spiritually healthy and relationally healthy until I became emotionally healthy. I thought I was. After all, I was a pastor. All pastors are emotionally healthy. Right, Gary? No. No. I was not emotionally healthy. Oh, I could debate and discuss all kinds of spiritual things. I loved Jesus, but I was not emotionally healthy. And that journey continues in our life. I think it's, it's a journey of, of a lifetime, uh, of working and discovering and, and processing uh, some of those emotions in our lives. <clears throat> Here's a quote. To deny what we feel impairs our ability to love God and others well, to feel is to be human and godlike. So to deny it, to keep pushing it down like I was, it, it affects my ability to love God and, and, uh, and my wife well. And, and to feel is to be human. And, and that's what I needed to get a hold of, that this God, I'm created in God's likeness and image. And my, actually, the second point here is God is an emotional being. Who feels? God is an emotional being. And I could, you know, you can read the scriptures, and if you have these, you know, colored lenses in your glasses where emotions are not good and all of that, you just kind of glance over that part of God as an emotional being. And you just see God as, you know, sovereign, uh, you know, all, all the other aspects of his character. But when you begin to look under the surface and say, it's okay. God has created me as a person who feels. And God is an emotional being himself. Our emotions reflect the nature of God. Whoa! Yeah. God is an emotional being, and we were created in his image as emotional human beings. So I, I had to get to the place where I could say, emotions are good. And they are a gift from God. That the emotions, the things I feel, the things that I always thought were not good or spiritual, emotions are good. They're neither, see, they're neither good nor bad. It's what, I, what we do with them. But God created us as emotional beings. So in that sense, they're good. Because when God created us, what did he say? It's good. He created Adam. It's good. Adam was an emotional being. Let's look at some scriptures. I, I want to help us to see God as he's presented in the word as an emotional being, one who feels and expresses his feelings, which then gives us, us permission to be like him. Jeremiah 31.3, the Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. You feel any emotion in that? I do as I read that. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. A lot of emotion, feeling there. Next. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Some translations with singing. I mean, that's just... Tell, you know, he's delighting in us. And when he delights in us, he just breaks out in song. 
Because he's, he's so, in, he's so uh, in love with us and that he wants to just rejoice with us. And so a lot of, again, I said, now as I read these scriptures, I see lots of feeling. I see lots of emotion. All right, let's move to the next one, Genesis. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. His heart was deeply troubled. That's that's an emotion. I, I feel that sometimes. Sometimes my heart is deeply troubled. I'm experiencing a God characteristic. I've been created like him, and I feel like him at times on different things. Uh, Going on to the next one. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Whoa, jealousy. Isn't that in the list in the Bible of sins? I'm a jealous God. For jealous for the right things, right? Next. Mark 3. He looked around at them in, in anger. This is Jesus. And deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. He was, Jesus just got, he just got upset with people. He, he was angry. He looked at them in anger, because they were just, ah, they just weren't open to what he wanted to do among them, and it made him angry. Again, I, Anger. That's on my sin list. That's on my list that I stay away from. I don't identify with anger. And that's why when the counselor told me I'm angry, I, I had no, no way of processing that. Because I only had one category for it, and that was sin. Moving on. Mark 10. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. I can understand those guys that he'd get angry with him at them at times. He said to them, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them. And I bet when he said, don't stop them, it wasn't, don't stop them. I I think he was, he said it with a lot, some volume and some feeling. Why? Because he was angry with them, the way they were treated kids. So we, we see a lot of different, is there another Mark 10? Where are we at here? There, Luke, Luke 10, 21. At the same time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so now we see another emotion that it's been expressed. Next one. My heart is torn within me. And that compassion overflows. We see the compassion of Jesus f- flowed out of just tremendous amount of emotion that was in him. My heart is torn within me. My heart is breaking. Jesus, I mean, and God, we're referring to Hosea, referring to God here. Is, is full of emotion. And I believe there's another one. John, this is the one that I like to memorize in <laughs> Sunday school. Jesus wept. Jesus was able to identify with those that were in deep mourning. This was over Lazarus' death because he was in touch with his emotions. The book of Psalms, we won't go there, but the Psalms teaches us to express our emotions to God. David was just a great example of an authentic person, an authentic person who was in touch with his emotions, and and he's, he's called a man after God's own heart. I wonder if part of that meaning is that he was authentic with his emotions, and God is authentic with his emotions, and their hearts were similar. Just one verse from Psalms 42, verse 5, how David was so in touch with this. He said, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? See, he took time to visit his heart. He didn't just shove all the feelings, and I'm a mighty warrior, and I'm this, and I claim the promises, and all. He, he stopped, and he, he went below the surface. He said, what's going on? Why am I sad? Where's all this discouragement coming from? What's going on? What's going on deep within me? David teaches us that it's okay to do that and how to visit that. Number three, 
We are to embrace our feelings, but not be controlled by them. So this is where we say, feelings, you're teaching us just to go run in our feelings? I mean, this place is going to go crazy if everybody just starts following their feelings. Well, we're supposed to embrace our feelings. In other words, don't shove them down, acknowledge them, work through them with God, but we're not to be controlled by them. And so we see that Jesus was very open in expressing his feelings, but he was spirit-led in the decisions he made and how he responded to them. To be spiritually healthy and mature, we embrace our feelings, yet we make right choices. So in the midst of maybe my anger, right now I'm, I'm just angry, I'm hurt uh, with what has happened. I, I, I can identify with that. I don't just shove it down. I say, okay, I'm, I'm really hurting about that. But now I have a choice to make. I can sin with my anger, or I can make the right choice and respond to the anger in a way that, that moves me toward life and, and healing in my life. So ignoring them, stuffing them, suppressing them keeps me spiritually immature. That's what happened. I just remain spiritually immature when I say, well, I'm just going to stuff that feeling, stuff that feeling, and not identify with that. So we don't deny or or ignore these feelings, but we surrender them to God's Spirit, and He shows us how to manage them. He shows us how to walk with them in a healthy way. For instance, we can feel and express the emotion of anger without sinning. We know the verse that says, be angry but don't sin. In other words, He's giving us permission to, to feel those feelings of anger. In fact, in the message in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. In other words, work through it. Don't go to bed angry. You got you go through it. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. But so it, it begins by identifying and saying, okay, I am angry. So I'm not judged, I'm not condemned for feeling angry, but what do I do with it then, is what what we're taught there in Ephesians 4. So we don't blindly follow our feelings, we acknowledge them, and then God helps us to walk through that. Uh, Scazzaro says in his book, if we keep denying our pain, I like this quote, if we keep denying our pain and feelings, we slowly transform into empty shells with smiley faces painted on them. Empty shells with smiley faces. Hey, good morning. How are you doing? I'm fine. When down underneath, we are not fine. Now, I understand in social settings, sometimes that's appropriate, that's okay, but it's just kind of a greeting we do with each other. But what I'm saying is we need to be careful that we don't, we don't live this way as empty shells, that when we're in a group setting where we can talk about what's going on in our lives, that we're willing to be honest, we're willing to be transparent, we're willing to be vulnerable and say, you know what, I'm not doing very well. really struggling right now it's not just a painted face anymore it's we become real because we discovered it's okay to have those feelings and we need to find safe places to process those feelings with each other we can't another quote we can't really connect with the pain and deep feelings of others if we have not processed our own pain and deep feelings with God. If I am not dealing with those issues in my life, when I encounter someone that is dealing with it, is going through it, it's hard for me to emotionally connect. I can counsel, I can say the right things because I learned the right things to say the spiritual things to say. But I can't really connect emotionally with other people 
if, they, if I haven't visited that area in my own life and that I'm not free in my own life to express those emotions. And so you can pick that up when you talk with someone. You can pick up whether they're connecting with you emotionally or, or whether they're just being, you know, a good friend, a good Christian, uh, and trying to give you good counsel. But it's that deeper connection that, that I think God wants us to have with each other. So for some Christians, <clears throat> faith is sometimes more of an intellectual pursuit. I heard one pastor say this, God wants us to not only know him intellectually and walk in obedience, but to feel him in our emotions. Or we will go through the motions of our faith walk. We will just go through the motions of our faith walk. In other words, we'll go to church and not necessarily get much out of it. But we did the thing you do Sunday mornings. If you're a good Christian, you go to church. Or you watch online. You know, just somehow, you go to church, right? And, uh, or we, we sing worship songs. Those were nice songs. I enjoyed that song. That was one of my favorite songs. But we're not moved. We're going through the motions. We read the Bible because we're trying to read the Bible and get through certain things. That's, that's what good Christians do. But we're not moved by the... What's, see, if we're not in touch with that emotional level, it, it just becomes motion. It just becomes duty. It just becomes something we do when we go to church but there's no, very little emotion there. God wants us to connect with him <clears throat> on all levels, including the emotional level. It's, you know, all meaningful relationships have that connection. They have that emotional connection. If I just related to my wife on an intellectual level, and, uh, and there's, there's not that emotional connection, I can't feel her emotions, or we say things to each other like, you shouldn't feel that way. Husbands, never say that to your wife, all right? I just, don't ever say that. I've said it, and it doesn't work, okay? <laughs> Again, when we are connecting there, we can, we can then relate to others. <clears throat> through our thoughts, this is on the screen, through our thoughts, we express what is in our minds, and through our feelings and emotions, we express what's in our hearts. That, that was an interesting. When I, when I read that, I thought, wow. So through our thoughts, I can say a lot of profound things about God this morning, share some great things. That's my thoughts. I'm expressing what's in my mind, what have I learned, and what I know about God, which is important. But it's through our feelings and emotions, we really express what's in our hearts. Um, Dan Alador and, and Trevor Lundman in the book, Cry of the Soul, say this, ignoring our emotions is turning our back on reality. Listening to our emotions ushers us into reality, and reality is where we meet God. Emotions are the language of the soul. They are the cry that gives the heart a voice. Our heart wants to speak, and wants to help guide us and direct us. So we're not just led by emotions, but emotions are one of the ways in which God does communicate with us and speaks to us. And it's one of, one of the ways we communicate who we are in an authentic way to other people as we allow the Holy Spirit to help us process those emotions, those feelings, and then to be led by the Spirit in how we live that. So the goal in this series is, is to help us rediscover our heart, the longing and the emotions that are in each of our hearts. So we go through this series the next four weeks. Uh, we, want to, we want to visit that as to what's going on in our hearts. How can we be more authentic, both in how we relate to God, how we relate to each other? And that's a journey. Like I said, it's, it's not just, well, we're, we're, we, we just are going to make that commitment this morning, and now it's, it's done. Now, we make a commitment. There's a choice involved, but then, then there's a journey of walking that out. Because to, to go under, like I said, to go under the surface can be a little scary. Uh, and so we, we want to go, in the, go on that journey together. I'm going to close with four things that uh, 
Scazzaro mentions in his book, these are four takeaways that I'm going to give you here as we end. He says, there's four practical truths to help us move toward emotional, healthy spirituality. So, okay, Pastor Lester, I heard what you have to say. Now what? Okay, here's the now what, what we can do. it. First of all, he says, pay attention to your interior in silence and solitude. We live in a very noisy world. There's a lot of noise and distractions all around us and going on inside of us. You know what happens when you try to get quiet with God for 10 minutes, 15 minutes? All the other things, pressing things just keep swirling around you and you're trying to shut it out so you can concentrate and focus. Well, we need to, we need to work at that because if we're going to visit what's the 90% underneath, um, there's, there's silence and solitude that need to happen. Um, in other words, this statement, it's hard to go beneath the surface, surface and get in touch with that emotional part of us that God created if we're not able to get quiet, alone, and listen. So we just got to create the time to do that. I know at times when, for me, one of, the, one of the signals for me that I need to pay attention to is when I begin to get irritable, when I begin to get short with people, uh, when uh, my thoughts are becoming more negative, I, I realize there's something going on and I just need that time alone to both hear God, be with God, but also time to ask like David did, why am I so discouraged? Why am I so irritable? What's going on? And, and you're not going to discover the answer to that if you're just running 90 miles an hour and with all the noise around you. Because oftentimes it's that still quiet voice of the Holy Spirit that begins to address those issues in our lives. So that's number one. Number two, find trusted companions. We need trusted, safe people around us on our spiritual journey to help us face our excuses. We were good at excuses. We're good at rationalizing our behavior and everything. We need people that will help us with that, those self-deceptions, the fear of looking below the surface, uh, help, people you feel safe with. Number three, move out of your comfort zone. Make a choice to connect with those feelings beneath the surface. Again, I mentioned it can be scary to go there, but it's beyond your comfort zone. It's beyond your comfort zone. I tell you, it's beyond your comfort zone to begin to really address some of your emotions and feelings. That Some of those things we, we have never visited, we've never looked at. There's some things that have happened to us in the past, and it, it was just too painful to go there. But there comes a time where God says, I'm going to go there with you. It's going to be okay. I'm going to walk through that memory with you. I'm going to help you. And you get in touch with those emotions, and you release those things to the Lord, and he brings healing into those areas of your life. And now you become a wounded healer that can heal other people who have gone through the same thing. But you have to go through it first. Number four, pray for courage. It takes courage to go there. Uh, whenever we change, we get some pushback from people around us. Uh, they want us to change back to the way we were. See, people are comfortable with the way we are, but as we change, uh, you know, they liked us better when they could walk over us. They liked us better when uh, we had a hard time saying no to their demands or their requests because we always felt guilty. or we. So they want us to change back. Listen, you'll feel some of that pressure that comes as you change. There's people, because what you're doing is you're not only changing yourself, but many times you're, you're changing uh, cycles of dependency, the status quo in, in your relationships or in your family. Multi-generational patterns and family structures begin to shift as you, as you make changes in your life. And that really can unsettle some people. Some people may get angry with you. But listen, change anyway. Change anyway. Change anyway. From glory to glory, he's changing us. Peter Sagero says this at the end here. Getting to know yourself so you can know God is the adventure of a lifetime. 
So we're inviting you to join this adventure in the next four weeks and beyond as a church family, as you give each other permission to be real, to be vulnerable, to be honest, and then we walk together under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that helps us to be more and more like Jesus in every way. Going beneath the surface to discover emotional, healthy spirituality. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church family. Lord, I thank you so much. Lord, for the leadership here, for their desire just to see, see us be healthy. Because, Lord, once we're healthy, we relate to you in a much more uh, authentic way. And we begin to relate to each other on just a whole deeper level of authenticity. So, Lord, I just pray for the, the teachings that are coming. I pray for those that will be leading the, 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 the teachings that you would just give them uh, just great anointing and understanding. And, Lord, that this place would continue to, to be known as a safe place that at this church, people can be real. That at this church, we're not just putting, painting smiles on our faces, but we're walking with each other through even some of the painful times. Lord, I pray for courage. Courage, Lord, to be able to say, yes, I am struggling. Courage to go into those, some of those deeper places, some of those memories of the past that still are there. And Lord, I just pray for healing and restoration Freedom, freedom, Lord, in our lives. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, I believe that you not only give us permission, but you invite us to go below the surface. And, Lord, when we go below the surface, we find you. You're there, Lord. You were there in our past. You're there now. And, uh, Lord, you will continue to grant us your grace in just some amazing ways. Thank you, Lord, for creating us in your likeness and your image with emotions that we can feel and share with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Gary. Amen. Thank you so much, Lester. Um, before, as part of our service, one thing that we are going to do is we're flip-flopping one thing around here. I'm going to invite uh, Becky and the elders and the pastors to come up to the stage here this time. Um, we had to flip-flop things around a little bit because Pastor Kobe was down at the um, ministering to the children and teaching. And so the elders asked if they could have a time of prayer for the, uh, the pastors. And so we're going to do that this time. And uh, also, Pastor Rick did, wanted me to remind you all. Uh, that this Friday we have our first Friday worship night, and the, the Fusion Youth Team are going to be leading worship. So I encourage you to come on out for that. Yeah. <laughs> come on out for that and encourage them. But, but also uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful time of us all worshiping together uh, Friday night. So please encourage you to come out to that. All right. Uh, Becky is the leader of our prayer and intercession, uh, intercession team, so uh, she's going to take it from here. You know what? I, I'm going to ask you all to stand. You guys know it's October and it's Pastors Appreciation Month. And, you know, when I look around, there's a scripture that says, you know, one will put 1,000 to flight and two will put 10,000. Think of the prayers right now going up on behalf of our pastors, their wives, families, and Hopewell. So I got up early this morning and I think God gave me a prayer for you guys. So I wrote it out, which I'm sometimes hard to do <laughs> anyway oh father heavenly father we give you thanks for these men and the pastoral heart that you have given them to lead the sheep at hopewell in john 10 you gave us the picture of a good shepherd you've put the same calling on these men to watch over and guide this flock at hopewell and we want to thank them and bless them as a congregation you know their hearts their struggles and families and what they, they do for us. And it's not done alone, but with the help and support of wives and children and families. Father, we ask for us as a church that you, Holy Spirit, would remind us to pray for them in all areas of need. Remind us to pray for their families and find ways to bless them and encourage them. In Ephesians, Paul asked for prayer in chapter 6. 
And I pray for me that my words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mysteries of the good news. Thank you, God, that if Paul asked for prayer, these men can ask for that same prayer. Father, we ask, just as Paul asked for prayer, to open their mouths and, and that they may be proclaimed. And we as a congregation that heeds that prayer, and we pray for them daily, not only to feed us, but meet their needs at once. Father, we know how much you love to answer prayers, and you delight in giving them the desires of their heart. Let us be sensitive to how much you've put in them, and let us give grace to them, not just as pastors, but as family men. I want to pray specifically for Pastor Wayne. Father, Pastor Wayne needs a healing, a touch. And as we do as a congregation, we pray for his healing. We ask you to touch and eradicate all cancer from his body. Even today, as we lift up our prayers with faith to the one that heals, you are hearing and we are believing for what your word declares, that by your stripes, Wayne is healed. Father, we not only thank you for our pastors, but we want to recognize each of their wives and pray as they stand together as a couple that they too need our prayers. Sometimes they are silent partners, but have a love for the congregation as deep as their husbands. They also see the toll that ministry can have on their husbands and their loved ones and carry that to you in prayer. But now we lift up some of that off of them and we hold up their hands and proclaim that with them the battle is the Lord's. We want to thank their wives for sharing these men with us and loving this congregation like shepherds also. We bless our pastors and your families and we proclaim the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. We love you all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.